Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we are here on session eight of MOOC 15. I am thrilled to be back uh, here with you all. I know we've had a change of schedule and you've had two back-to-back -back sessions. So I know that might be tough uh, for everyone to have had those two in a row. I think Andreas was sick last week and had to delay his session. And on my side, uh, on Thursday, the university's closed, so we had to move this. It's a national holiday here, and so for the benefit of the team, we had to move up this session up. And so I know you've now had back-to-back -back, back -back sessions. For those who can't make it back-to-back, -back, it's okay. We will make these available on a recorded basis, as always, and you can catch up then. I believe, and Dimitri can correct me if I'm wrong, that next week is also on a Tuesday. And so, uh, given that, if you can adjust your schedule, uh, that would be fantastic. And then we go back on the normal Thursday schedule, I think, and hope for the rest of the, for the, rest of the time. So, today's session is financial services, central banks, cryptocurrency, how these things may or may not interrelate. We don't have a ton of questions so far, and I think this has to do with the tight session. So I'm going to answer the questions that we do have. I don't know if, Dimitri, there have been other questions since the first set, and if, so you can ping me them. Then we'll, I have the chat open today, so I can keep an eye on if there are any other questions, and if not, we um, I'm happy to chat about things that I think are interesting, as I usually am. So, let me jump in and see if we can clear the pre-existing questions, and then we'll go from there. First question, which is an excellent question. What is the difference between a fiat-backed stablecoin or the impending central bank-issued digital currencies? Um, so this is a great question, and I think this has to do a very, the key to the distinction, the reason there's a distinction, has to do with who the issuer is. So in the case that it's not the central bank, means it's anyone other than the central bank, it's some type of organization, right? We can discuss what, if it's a traditional organization like a commercial bank or a organization like some of these new startups that are making these stable coins like Circle. But one is the central bank of the country. That's one category. The second category is literally everyone else and anyone else. Anyone else who is not the central bank has to solve one problem. And that problem is they are not the issuers of the fiat and I think to make this example easy, we'll use euros. Sometimes I use dollars, this week we'll use euros, since it's uh, the ECB has been chit-chatting about a digital euro for a while the last few months. So let's think about if you're the sun ECB or if you're literally anyone else and you want to make a digital euro, in other words, a token, that is a bearer instrument that you, you can buy and trade and transact and sell digitally, that you can buy and sell it on exchanges. And when you're selling it on exchanges, you're selling it in exchange for other fiat currency stable coins or crypto tokens or so on, right? So this is this is the model. And so when, when you're selling it, right, there's buyers and sellers, there's a price. And the hard thing here, why stable coins are difficult and in a way much, much more difficult than regular cryptocurrency, is you have to keep that price stable. And really, it's quite stable. If you're saying, I'm issuing a digital euro, 
And the whole point of the digital euro is for people not to take currency risk. Um, the expectations will be, will need to be, their whole value proposition, you really have no other value proposition as the fact that that thing is worth one euro. Just like when you have a liability or an asset in a commercial bank, not in a decentralized system, in a centralized system, you might have counterparty risk the bank on default or something, right? But you don't have um, unit of account risk, right? It's a euro. A euro is a euro is a euro. So if I send a euro from my bank account to Dimitris's bank account, I'm not worried that when I sent it, it was actually 1.1 euros central bank ECB euros. And when Dimitri got it, it's 0.95 or 0.1.05. Or even, quite frankly, you don't expect it to be one day one and one day one and one cent. Right? Because these things add up on big on big transactions. So if it's a million dollar transaction and you say, oh, it's just a cent. Yeah, but it's a million cents. It starts to add up. Right? And a million dollars is not necessarily a big transaction. Like big companies transact in tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So your main job is to keep it linked to the fiat national sovereign currency. And by keep it linked, the interesting part isn't that you say it's linked. You can say whatever you want. I can say that Polamidas coins are always going to trade one to one with euros. But that's not my decision. The decision is made by a market on exchanges around the world with buyers and sellers who not only don't care about my promise, might be trying to actively benefit from breaking my promise. Right? If they if my promise is that a Polamidas coin is worth a euro and someone doesn't believe it and they think, no, that's not true, I don't think Antonis's peg is going to hold, I'm going to go vastly short on Polamidas coin and hope if I break the peg, I will make a lot of money. So stable coins are operating in an environment that is actively hostile to them maintaining the peg. So what do people do? Here's a fiat. There's two buckets of these stable coins, right? There's fiat backed, asset backed, collateralized coins, where you basically say, to simplify, I, Antonis Polamidas, I'm issuing 10,000 Polamidas euros and I have 10,000 Polamidas euros in my bank account. And so if you ever bring back your Polamidas euro, I will give you a real euro, a normal euro. Most of the time, right, the difficulty with the peg is on the downside. It's usually, it's usually some weird edge conditions where they trade above their fiat parallel, right? The risk is that the Polamidas euro isn't the same thing as the digital euro, that it's worth less. Well, why could that risk be the case? Well, maybe I don't really have them in the bank account. This is a big issue with UST, with tethers, right? People were concerned for a very long time that the tethers weren't real. Tethers were saying, oh, no, no, I have them. And they say, well, show them to us. They say, well, do an audit. Okay. You can do an audit. It might be difficult. Let's say you can do an audit. What's the audit going to tell you? That I had 10,000 euros in my bank account that day. Does that give you any assurances that I have 10,000 euros in my bank account the next day? It doesn't. Maybe the next day I can send them to someone else. Maybe I borrowed them unofficially from someone to show the auditor, oh, here, here's 10,000 euros. And then the next day, bye-bye, baby, there are no more 10,000 euros. We're, once again, not asset-backed, not fiat-backed. But there could be other issues. 
maybe the money is there, but I don't execute on my contract. You come and say, contractual obligation, give me a real euro. And I say, no, I'm unhappy with Dimitri today. I don't think he should get to redeem his euros. Whatever, you said so, conditions on the contract. Yeah, maybe I did, right? We take the extreme case that I did, and there's no doubt that I did. But I don't want to give the Demetrius the money. Well, what's going to happen? What's well, going to take me to court? Well, how long is that going to take? I'm guessing a lot longer than whatever it is that Dimitri needs the money for. Right? So maybe he would find relief in the justice system over some next period of time. But if he wanted real euros today to buy his car, he still has a problem. Maybe I want to fulfill my contractual obligations, but something's happened. I'm dead. My company's bankrupt. I'm incapacitated. The banking system in Cyprus has been frozen. This has happened before. There are many reasons why you would imagine that Polamidis Euro trades for less than Euro Euro. And there's some weird reasons we won't really get into of why, like, in why some situations it could trade for more. Which is also bad, because you don't actually want it to go up in price, right? You don't want it to go up, you don't want it to go down, you want it to stay exactly at this price when you have people who are going to try and move the price around. They might go, say, spread rumors. And Tonus is dead. He's run away with the euros. Sell all your Polamidas euros immediately because they have a short position on them. The price goes down. Well, even a handful of these episodes are enough to burn the trust of the users of the currency who need it to be stable. And so, what are the ways, reasons, approaches people could use, right? Well, one reason, a way, approach, could be to be institutionally credible in their own right. If I issued 10,000 Polamidas euros, or let's make it more realistic, 10 million Polamidas euros, you might worry quite a bit if I'm really good for it. If JP Morgan Chase issued 10 million Chase euros and said, no, I have reserves and cash, and I'm regulating the bank, and my balance sheet is hundreds of billions of dollars. I think actually the balance sheet might have crossed a trillion dollars. I'm good for 10 million. Okay, you can imagine things that can go wrong, but quite a lot fewer than um, the things that can go wrong with me. You can do audits. You can over-collateralize. You can say, look, I have issued 10,000 euros, but I actually have 20,000. So, Whatever you do, though, there is some failure state. There is some state of the world where the issuer may or may not be able to deliver euros to you or is delayed when delivering. Let's talk now about the central bank. Let's say you hold a $1 bill, it's cash, not digital cash, though, old-fashioned cash. It is redeemable at the Federal Reserve. What do you get when you redeem it? A $1 bill. Why is this very low risk? Because they, I cannot print dollars, right? Like if someone hacks my bank account and my $10 million are gone, I cannot make more. Federal Reserve can create and destroy money. They're the issuer. They are immensely credible on the question of, is this dollar a dollar? Could they be buyers and sellers at one dollar at all points in time for that dollar, that digital dollar? Can 
they always say, yep, we will always buy for a dollar and sell for a dollar, and we can do this in any amount, and we'll do that. In fact, just them saying that means that other people can arbitrage away price differences. And this might be confusing to people. Let me describe this. Let's say the Federal Reserve says, I will buy and sell unlimited amounts of <coughs> USD coins at $1. What happens if a, a certain exchange, a certain trading pair, the digital dollar is trading away from that one dollar point? Well, it's very easy. It's free money for someone. If it's trading at 90 cents, someone can buy it at 90 cents, walk over to the Federal Reserve and say, give me a dollar for it. If it's trading at a dollar ten someone can sell it for a dollar ten go buy a dollar for the Federal Reserve for a dollar give the seller their dollar back and make ten cents and because that system allows people to arbitrage away differences it should in and of itself keep it effectively at the exact stability and in a worst case scenario the central bank could do it themselves they could go buy and sell in the market if they're having some type of traumatic stability event that doesn't allow the arbitraging people to do their job correctly and so it's a huge difference the only truly, truly, truly credible stablecoin issuer is the central bank of that specific currency. Everything else is a form of currency peg. Currency pegs have broken many times. They might break for central banking reasons. You know, the story I said about going short and breaking the peg. It's a very famous story, right? 1992. George Soros made a billion pounds when he managed to break the peg of the Great British Bank. He thought the bank couldn't intervene enough in the market to keep it at the peg, and it turns out he was right. This won't happen to a central bank in their own currency. Now, the currency might lose value relative to other currencies, a dollar might be worth fewer euros. That's fine. That's normal. That happens anyway. But it's very hard for a dollar to be worth fewer dollars or more dollars. For a central bank issuer, you could imagine it happening both ways in edge cases. What are those edge cases? People who do not have direct access to the central bank's national financial system. So let's say it is valuable to have digital dollars in Afghanistan. But the central bank is trying to, doesn't, let's say they're KYC to these digital dollars. Um, know your customer registration, checking to see if the people using them are allowed to use them if the American considers them terrorists or whatever. Well, in that case, if someone gets a digital dollar into the Afghanistan ecosystem, you could imagine it trades for more than a dollar because it's useful. It's there. It's past the KYC screen somehow, right? You could also imagine the other arbitrage not working in um, some types of restricted markets. If they're trading, I don't know, in Myanmar and there's somehow restrictions on moving tokens or currencies out of the country and it's fallen below a dollar because there's a new rule that you can only exit to local currency and can you take your 95 cents and take it to the Federal Reserve and get a dollar back? Maybe not. So maybe we'll trade at a discount. Maybe we'll trade at a premium because people don't really want the local coin, they want the US dollar. I don't know. But in markets that are somehow illiquid, isolated, non-transparent with 
the home market, you could imagine even for a central bank backed stablecoin for it to deviate a little bit. But on the whole, under normal conditions, the central bank is the right issuer for stablecoins. Everyone else will be close, but not exactly right. They might be um, pretty close. You know, a JP Morgan coin is going to trade pretty close to your dollar. But there could be conditions of stress. Maybe they're once every 10 years. Maybe they're once every 20 years. But there could be conditions of stress if you had a global financial crisis like you did in 2008. And people started worrying that maybe all the commercial investment banks are actually insolvent. And therefore, they don't want to be exposed to them. And the JP Morgan coin is exposed, in fact, the balance sheet of JP Morgan. Um, well, maybe we'll lose the peg. Now, a more sophisticated version, they will allow you to never do that. You need to hold it in a trust, in a custodian. It's got to be a trust, it's got to be bankruptcy remote from any of the issuer. And it's segregated from other topics. So, true, that's better. It's an improvement. But I don't know, something could go wrong. Maybe there's some catastrophic crisis that, that the trust or the trustee or the custodian. You never know. So I think on the whole, you will have the CBDC is the only true, 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 true stablecoin. Everything else is some deviation away from a perfect stablecoin. The deviation in a highly professionalized, fully collateralized, fully audited, the very trustworthy issuer is going to be small. The deviation if Polamida starts issuing hundreds of millions of dollars of stable coins and starts saying, yeah, yeah, no, they're for sure backed with hundreds of millions of dollars. And okay, Andres, can you show me this? No, sorry, I can't. Can you do an audit? Nope, can't. But trust me, they're backed. Well, I suspect that coin will deviate quite a bit. And so that's the spectrum. It's the spectrum of the issuer risk, and it's the fundamental difference between the two, which was the question. Okay, next question, CBDC design considerations. What are some of the design considerations and feature trade-offs that central banks will have to consider? Will all CBDCs Allow for peer-to-peer -peer payments? If so, would that not be a large disintermediation of commercial banks? If so, why would a central bank go for a CBDC in the face of resistance from large and influential commercial retail banks? What are the key selling points slash value adds for a central bank to consider issuing their own CBDC? Other than getting rid of cash, and move transaction visibility from retail banks to the central banks? So, this is a great question. It's a complicated question. Um, let's work backwards. The first thing we're going to say is they're all going to be different. Uh, in the presentation, we laid out some of the design parameters. Are they going to be direct, indirect, or hybrid? Are they going to be KYC or not KYC? Um, each country might make different decisions. Will you be able to make peer to peer payments? If it's direct or hybrid, maybe. If it is indirect, no. It will just be used by the financial institutions, and you, the consumer, will still have to run through a financial institution. Now, do we have peer-to-peer um, -peer transactions today? Sure, cash. You don't have to be intermediated by a financial institution. And on a global basis, cash is still the most used transaction mechanism, though there are some countries like Sweden that have all but managed to eliminate it. Yeah. It says, what are the key selling points other than getting rid of cash? Central banks love the idea of getting rid of cash. They love the idea of getting rid of cash for two reasons. One, it allows them to enforce restrictions on payments, whether those are anti-money laundering, uh, terrorism finance, 
undesirable activities, political dissidents, um, sensitive industries. Oh no, you can't pay for your marijuana with your digital euros, right? And the other reason is tax collection. Right? They worry that people will make cash transactions and they won't see them and that they can't collect taxes on them. Um, that's one reason they like it. The other reason, or two, the third reason is so they can impose negative interest rates. So they can say, well, we need to boost the economy. We've hit the zero bound, which we've hit in many countries in the last few years. If you go too far negative, if your bank account, you know, in Cyprus now, commercial bank accounts, right? Yeah, size of institutions like Unicum, higher, now pay a negative interest rate. It's negative 0.5%. So you put your money in the bank and they're guaranteed to take some from you. Um, okay, we don't like it, right? It's annoying. But we tolerate it. What if it was negative 10%? Uh, I think we do other things. We keep some on campus, put some in a safe deposit box, do something else, take it out to cash, right? 10% is pretty painful. In our institutions, it might be hard to do it at scale, but an individual, yeah, come put in the safe at home. And so, so long as there's cash, there's cash, it provides a lower bound on what, how low, lower bound, an upper bound on how low an interest rate can go. So they would like to remove it. It's interesting that one of the members of the Board of Governors of the ECB said this openly. We want to have a digital euro so we can have heavily negative interest rates. It's weird, right? Like, it's what everyone suspects they want to do. It's A, a little bit weird to say it out loud, and it's B, going to be quite unappealing, right? I mean, I think people are going to get quite irritated. And you say, oh, cool, you've saved up $50,000, and next year they're going to be 47500 and next year they're going to be 45000 and so on. And I think people will find that frustrating. So we have um, those three reasons that they want them. I think there's a fourth reason. Natively, digital money has uses. People didn't quite realize this or believe this before Bitcoin. But now when you're seeing a vast set of economic activity being conducted um, online with digital tokens, say, so, oh, wow, that'd be really useful. And maybe it'd be useful to be able to do this with out taking currency risk, right? If I want my car to have a built-in Euro wallet and automatically pay for parking or pay toll fees on the highway, maybe pay another car to get out of its way so it can go faster. No particularly good reason why you'd want that to also be a Bitcoin, Ether, Monero, Zcash, whatever, something that has a, a fluctuating price. Right? You're truly doing this for digital payment utility. Um, and if you're doing it for payment utility efficiency, you don't really want to start driving from Nicosia to Limassol and you have 50 bucks for $10 for tolls. And by the time you get to Limassol, I don't know, Bitcoin has crashed and you only have $8 left and don't have enough money to pay the tolls. I mean, a, that's not a feature, that's a bug. Right? If you believe that a certain crypto asset will go up in price, that's great. And that might be an interesting investment, but there's no reason for this to go into your transaction mechanics. So I think they've realized a little bit grudgingly that there are uses for these things. And maybe it would be good if they provided it in the unit of account of the country. And I think it would be good, and they should. So 
I'd say those are like four reasons they would like to do it. Um, would they have resistance from the banks? Yeah, I mean, probably. Right? I don't think they'll, in a direct model, maybe not in a hybrid or an indirect model. There's an interesting question now of, is the transaction banking part of retail banks something that you would design it this way if you were inventing payment systems and banking systems, etc. in 2021? In ye old days, when this started, right, when Federal Reserve, sorry, 1912, I think, obviously you needed banks not just to, for money creation and to borrow short and lend long and all of those things that banks do and someone's going to need doing, but just transaction banking could not be done central. Right? There's 12 Federal Reserve branches in the United States. The United States is a big place. Either you'd need people going to, I don't know, St. Louis to deposit money, write a check, what have you. Or the Federal Reserve would have to roll out branches throughout the country. Does not sound like a great, a thing likely a central bank is going to be great at. Right? It's a big operational thing. That's something probably better for private business. In which case, you had the retail banks there to do that and a whole bunch of other things. They eventually offered a whole bundle of financial services, and it was handled by the private sector. Well, today, you could give people who, in a world of online banking, or mostly online banking, you could give people access to a central bank form of money. I mean, the other version, the non-tokenized version that is discussed sometimes that is along these lines is could you, should you offer people the ability to open a savings account, a checking account, or whatever, at the National Central Bank. This wasn't really in the air 15 years ago, but the global financial crisis, the European crisis, the Cyprus haircut, the Greek banking freeze, all of this shook people's confidence in retail slash commercial banks. They say, well, I just and, you know, the ECB came when they haircut the separate depositors. Well, well, people should have known, they should evaluate the credit risk of the bank that they're lending money to. I thought this was nonsense, right? Like, I mean, the, the average retail depositor has a bank account to pay their bills, pay their utility bills, write checks, not keep their money under their bed. Their job is not to evaluate the counterparty risk of Bank of Cyprus. Evaluating the balance sheet of a bank, the Bank of Cyprus is something that like dedicated investment banking financial analysts would find very hard and anyway, failed to do in the case of the Cypriot banks and anyway, more importantly, failed to do in the case of the regulator. The person whose job was checking to make sure the banks weren't overly risky was the Central Bank of Cyprus, the European Central Bank. You can't really, I was baffled when I saw this announcement, you can't really take the position that the ECB didn't realize that Bank of Cyprus was too riskily structured, but area grandma from a mountain village was supposed to be doing a full banking model before depositing at their local co-op, right? I mean, come on, it's ridiculous. So this idea really accelerated after these events. It's like, well, People need utility banking, they need transaction banking. They don't actually, interest rates are anyway next to zero. Why do I need to take on counterparty risk just in order to have my money somewhere, not under my pillow, and be able to pay my utility bill? And I don't think there's a good answer to that question. I don't see that like it's necessarily the case that you would design the system this way. That, what I just described doesn't require tokens, but it also could be implemented in tokens, right? A tokenized dollar. Now, when you have money at, you have $200,000 at Chase. What do you have? Do you have $200,000? Not exactly. 
what you have is a hundred thousand dollars that are probably pretty good as a hundred thousand dollars are federally insured dollars so it's probably pretty close to a dollar and a hundred thousand dollars where you're an unsecured creditor of JP Morgan Chase and that's something that most of the time under most conditions is about a hundred thousand dollars but not all the time not under all conditions if you have a central bank digital currency a CBDC dollar well, you'll have a dollar it's like holding a dollar in cash you have no counterparty risk but usually the price you pay for not having that counterparty risk is you might lose it right digital tokens as implemented cash as implemented if you lose it no one's going to give it back to you and so like the ability to open an account directly with the federal reserve maybe gives you no counterparty risk no risk that you lose it does it upset the retail and commercial banks yes does it also worry the central bank that you know you want the banks out there making loans helping the economy develop and the central bank doesn't have the capacity to do that even though you can have like an online checking account so to speak with the federal reserve you can't really be like in the lending business and loan evaluation underwriting and so on and so this discussion is in the air now but probably if i had to guess the current system will remain the system for a while now. i don't think it's immediately going away i think there's a lot of embedded infrastructure mechanics of how the system works that would be difficult uh, to change all right <clears throat> Central banks, sooner or later, are going to issue their own local digital currencies. How would those protocols communicate with each other? Or will an exchange of those CBDCs technically not be necessary anymore? Oh, well, it's not going to be the latter. People will definitely, even in a CBDC world, want to change, exchange one CBDC for another. The single biggest financial market in the world is euros to dollars. Seven, eight trillion are traded every single day. And that's from people trading it for practical purposes. They need to buy something in euros or in dollars to hedge their future exposure, to try and make money on changes in currency markets. They're the most liquid markets in the world. And so that doesn't go away if you go digital. And so the question is, how do you trade one for the other? Well, there are three ways. The first two are pretty clear. The third, we'll have to see. It depends on their design decisions. The first is you go to a centralized exchange of some type, whether that's called uh, a Coinbase or whether that's called something like the current currency markets maybe it's called something that's designed by the central banks themselves and they actually hold both coins they have liquidity of both coins and you go and you trade one for another so that is one approach the other approach you know, a decentralized exchange there you would need to wrap it I haven't really touched this in the course but you can trade Bitcoin on an Ethereum DeFi exchange, but you're not really trading Bitcoin. You're trading something that's close to Bitcoin. It's a token where you've locked up a Bitcoin and in exchange you get this token and those two should trade similarly, though not exactly. The third method would be if they use compatible blockchains, and if they're blockchain-based systems in the first place, I mean, that they have an integration with each other that they can trade directly. The fourth method is they might not use blockchains at all. They might just use databases. 
I don't think that's what they're going to do. I think they're going to use some type of blockchain. But they could just use a big Oracle database and have the database just talk to each other. So I think you will have a change between one type of CDBC and a different type of CDBC. The mechanism of the exchange, I think, is going to depend on the design decisions of the central banks and we probably will have multiple of the ones I described. We probably won't just have one. We'll probably have multiple of these methods available to exchange from one to another. Okay, so these were the questions um, beforehand. I see we have a couple of questions in the chat. So let's look at those. And then we'll talk about a couple of things. What would the surveillance, would the surveillance and censorship features and negative interest rates of CBDCs act as a Trojan horse for Bitcoin adoption? Yeah. Um, I think it means exactly a Trojan horse. I think it's like an incentive for Bitcoin adoption. The answer is obviously yes, but obviously in a world where this is a serious issue, People will also be fighting Bitcoin adoption. The same people who are doing these things will be fighting Bitcoin adoption. Right? Like, and there has been a multi-decade process to try and assert more control over the financial system. Uh, AML, KYC, reduction of uses of cash. I believe generally with good intentions, right? Like, nobody is in favor of terrorist financing. Nobody's really in favor of people cheating on their taxes. I mean, some people might be. No one's, no one's conceptually in favor of someone else cheating on their taxes. I mean, again, some exceptions. Um, so, the intentions are good. I don't know if there's going to be an overreach. Right? Like, they might be good intentions, but say every single transaction should be monitorable. Um, we ought to be able to make super negative interest rates. I don't know. I'm not thrilled with that as a concept. Neither one nor the other. And the reason I'm not thrilled with particularly the every transaction can be monitored is my concern about edge cases and failure cases of those systems. And the edge case of that system is someone who is not scrupulous about democracy, privacy, separation of powers, gets control of that system. I don't want to go as far as saying a dictator, though that's obviously the full edge case of that. But someone, something between a well-intentioned public servant and a dictator. You could imagine them taking severe advantage of that system. It's always tricky in these things because let's say you are well-intentioned. If you ask me, Antonis, do you think we should reduce illicit flows of capital? Yeah, I think so. Should we reduce tax evasion? Yeah, I think that's a good idea too. Tax policy should be transparent. Maybe it should be lower or higher, but it should be transparently implemented. It shouldn't be that like some people pay and some people don't because reasons, or because some people are cheating, per se. So I agree with this. But once you have the ability to see every single thing that someone does, every single financial transaction, and to block it if you want, well, suddenly you're giving someone a lot of power. And one of the basis for kind of all democratic systems of governance is some form of proportionality um, between the state power and the citizens' power. You know, if you ask me, am I against car accidents? I would say, yes, I'm against car accidents. If you ask me, am I in favor of speed limits? Because 
they cause car accidents. I said, well, yeah, I think so. I can argue a little bit about where the speed limit should be, but like, yeah, conceptually, I'm in favor of speed limits. If you ask me, is it desirable to keep everyone from speeding? Yeah, it's desirable. Okay. If you ask me, should we execute anyone who speeds? I would say, whoa, 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 whoa. getting a little crazy, right? No, of course we shouldn't execute everyone who speeds. Right? It's a balance. Like most people who speed get away with it, actually, in today's world, and some that do pay a fine, and if they're egregious, they'll pay a big fine or lose their license or go to jail or whatever. And but you could take you could drive speeding to zero by executing everyone who speeds. But we don't, because it's disproportionate. My sense is a system where it's impossible to make a payment to anyone without the state's explicit authorization is probably disproportionate to the objectives that people have in mind. And it's really tricky because I think most of the people pro proposing these systems have good intentions. I'm not going to say maybe it's naive, but I think most of them are like good public servants and they see the downside of um, illicit money flows and say, oh, look, if we had only known this, maybe we could have stopped this terrorist attack. This is true. There's a price to not to allowing some speeding, and sometimes like a car will crash and people will die, and it'll be a tragedy. I'll say, oh, how can we avoid this in the future? And so on. But there's kind of no free lunch in governance, like there's no free lunch in economics. What you're doing in a system like that, you are trading an improvement in day-to-day -day undesirable outcomes. Undesirable. for a higher risk of a low probability, extremely undesirable outcome. And that extremely undesirable outcome is, I don't know, imagine broadly speaking your worst enemy getting a hold of that system. Imagine someone with dictator-like tendencies. Imagine what you could do with that system. Imagine you see the political opposition organizing for the election. You start blocking their payments. Oh, but that would be illegal. I don't know. Maybe. But by the time you figure all that out, the election's over. And they weren't able to pay their vendors. They weren't able to rally organizers. They weren't able to do many things. The financial system is often also used as a hidden weapon of sorts against societal activities that are not strictly speaking illegal, but are viewed as un undemocratic, uh, undesirable. A couple of examples. There's this thing in the United States called Operation Choke Point. And I'm not making actually a left wing or right wing political point, it actually does. It works against both. Gun sales, pornography. Things that like people get alarmed, cryptocurrency activities. All these things are legal in the United States. A lot of them have trouble getting banking. A lot of them have trouble getting banking because in the background, there's pressure being put on the banks to not bank them and pressure being put on the payment processors to not bank them. Is that good? I think that's almost exclusively bad. And that's not has nothing to do with my opinion of whether a gun store should be illegal or um, pornography should be illegal. It's a different question. I believe if it's legal, you should allow them to have access to banking. If you believe they are illegal, they should be made illegal. We should not allow this. We should regulate it, whatever your beliefs are. Well, there is a perfectly well understood governance model in a democracy for expressing your beliefs. That is called pass a law. And if you can't pass a law, it's called win an election so you can pass a law. 
go take your beliefs to population. And if you think gun sales or drug sales or pornography sales or whatever thing that is that bothers you should not be allowed in your country, fair enough. Go win an election and make that happen. Democracies have these checks and balances, this governance for this reason. What feels to me quite anti-democratic is for the actual democratic system to say, yeah, no, no, this stuff's legal. We weren't able to pass a law making it illegal. And then someone who is somewhere in the bureaucracy, not known to the citizens, not accountable to the citizens, decides that your marijuana dispensary in Colorado should not be able to get a bank account. Your cryptocurrency exchange in New York should not be able to get a bank account. I don't think that's correct instruction. I don't think that's the way that's the way policy, laws, or regulations should be implemented in a democracy. They should be implemented transparently. Same thing happened with WikiLeaks, right? It's almost certainly not the case that anything WikiLeaks is certainly having a website. Almost certainly First Amendment protected. Um, so what happened? The federal government pressured Visa and MasterCard and cut off payments to them. Okay. Doesn't seem to me like the most elegant or appropriate way to do it. And then they started accepting the Bitcoin and so on. And so there's this interesting and I think very, in a way, dramatic dynamic going on where there has been a long-standing societal push to gain centralized control over the financial system. I believe that push started with good intentions. I believe some people pushing that still have good intentions, but maybe aren't fully thinking about the potential black swan type downsides of a system like that. Maybe some people pushing it don't have the greatest intentions of view it as a way for to centralize power and organizations that they have power. But it's hard to tell. Don't want to judge people's motivations. And at the same time, conveniently or inconveniently, depending on how long, a set of technologies have emerged that technically circumvent these types of restrictions. And there's an interesting question of how tough that battle is going to be between the increasingly centralized, increasingly regulated system and these decentralized, more resilient systems. But I mean, none of them are, it's very interesting when people say like, oh no, no, they couldn't do that to Bitcoin or DeFi or whatever. Depends what they couldn't means. Can you eliminate Bitcoin? No. You cannot. There will always be people running it somewhere in the world that you can't practically get to. Could you do a tremendous amount of damage to its adoption price utility? Sure. Legislate the big exchanges out of business. Make it illegal to hold cryptocurrency. That would drop utilization down 90 something percent. You'd have some hardcore people doing it as a matter of principle, running it as a matter of principle. But you could absolutely reduce its impact in the real world. Is that a particularly liberal and democratic Western society thing to do? No, not really. But I don't know how it's going to play out. The Financial Action Task Force that sets these types of rules came out on Friday with a set of recommendations that are very aggressive. That are basically trying to de decentralize crypto. Basically trying to break any links between people who use crypto in a centralized manner through 
a virtual asset service provider that's KYC and people who are using it in the wild. Is that going to be adopted? I don't know. Is it going to be pushed back? Yeah, a lot of it. Where does it all end up? I don't know. It's a financial action task force, democratically accountable. Not directly, only through the members that are sent by the countries that are part of it. Does it tend to be sort of aggressive on these things? Yeah, it does. May they have good intentions? Yeah, probably. Probably have good intentions. Are they going to overreach? Probably. They're going to overreach. So, there's a very interesting dynamic here. And it's a dynamic that's actually much more important even than crypto, because I think it's an issue that exists. Crypto, in a way, is a reaction to it. It's not the fun, it's not the driver of it, it's the reaction to it. And I think it's an under discussed issue of privacy and rights. You can see each, like I've spent time in the, a lot of time in the US and the EU, right? So, US gets very intense on, say, on gun rights, free speech. The EU under GDPR gets very intense on privacy. You can make cases either way on each one of these. But in both cases, financial privacy and financial supervision and financial control and surveillance is, in my opinion, a much bigger issue than the types of privacy issues that GDPR addresses, and almost wholly absent from any public debate on where we should set the line in society. I don't think that's healthy. Like you could have different opinions on how much central oversight there should be over payments. That's fair. That's fine. But they're primarily not discussed, right? Primarily you just hear one view. The view of, oh, we're doing anti-money laundering. Stay out. It's, this is, we're here to police this. But that's not, that's not the case. It's like any other citizen right, privacy right. It's a balance. There's a proportionality. And so, Yes, to the question, it will make Bitcoin more appealing, but they will also, Bitcoin and other crypto assets, they will also pressurize, pressure unregulated, unKYC crypto assets. And so this tension, I don't know if it's going to be a battle, but for sure this tension between those two worlds is definitely coming up. Um, very briefly on the last question, will Bitcoin and blockchain in general help with transaction settlements? Yeah, absolutely. Depends what I mean. Bitcoin and Ethereum settle huge numbers of transactions today in primarily non-traditional ways of transacting. If you're running a decentralized exchange, you're settling in Ethereum. Right? If uh, 10 years from now, your self-driving car is making micropayments, it's probably going to settle on some type of blockchain. So I think they do have important settlement dynamics, important settlement roles. Um, they're increasing year by year. I think we're discovering year by year how they can be used. And it is going to be an interesting endpoint of where 20 years from now, what things are settling in the traditional system, and what things are settling in a decentralized blockchain, or what things are settling in a permission blockchain. The answer is going to be all three, by the way, I can tell you. I can tell you that it's going to be all three. I can't tell you what the percentages and the types are. That's what we'll have to live through and find out. So, and that wraps up our session. We've done our hour. Thank you, as always, for joining. Um, thank you for your questions beforehand and in the chat. We will be doing this again next Tuesday. So, unlike uh, this week where we piled one onto another, uh, we'll have a normal week gap between the next one, and we'll try and get the presentation out sooner than Sunday, since it's going to be on Tuesday, so you do have a chance to look at it and think about questions. So thank you once again, everyone, and I'll catch up with you next week.